Somebody say theology proper. That kind of sounds a little British, you know, like, you know, to have a proper meal means to have like a, a legitimate thing, you know, like to do something right. So when you talk about theology proper, hey, Peter, how you doing? When you talk about theology proper, I like looking at it from, you know, that sort of linguistic vernacular perspective because uh, it's, it's like the best way to talk about theology. You know, theology is the study of God. But most people learn about theology as it relates to everything else Christian other than God, you know, uh, man, sin, evangelism, the Bible, uh, inerrancy, all of those things versus actually studying God and his character. So um, I definitely want to dive right in. Uh, like I said, when you come in, please share the video. Please like it. I want you to be engaged. I want you to comment, bring your questions. Um, and even if it's not necessarily related to theology proper, I'd love, love, love for you to um, uh, 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 bring those questions in and maybe I can shed light on them. Uh, so today we're looking at theology proper because theology proper is probably one of the most influential aspects of theology, right? Theology proper is the study of God himself, right? Not salvation, not in things, not the church, not the Bible, not emergent theology, not uh, any of those other things, but theology proper specifically deals with God, his character and his being. OK, so God's character and his being. Now, people might argue that his character is a part of his being. But for the sake of theology proper and for this discussion, we're going to differentiate uh, the two. Um, so like I said, theology proper covers um, our understanding of everything. And this is what I mean. How you understand God, how you process God and conceptualize God is going to greatly determine how you do everything else in the world. Right. And it's fitting because if God is the biggest, most important, most uh, universally uh, influential being in the universe. Right. Then thinking about him or how you think about him is going to have that gratitude or grab that that uh, gravitas in terms of its effect, that magnitude in terms of its effect and influence on you as a person in the universe. Uh, so one of the things I want to look at is overemphasis of God's characteristics, right? And this is why we're going to very briefly go through who God is. And what who, when I say who God is, I mean in character and in being, what it means for God to be God, right? And this is based on Bible and this is based on a few things in terms of a few principles in terms of philosophy and in logic that we'll look at. But primarily, this is based on the Bible, as all things about God and the world should be. OK, so we have to have a balanced view of God, saints and friends. OK, we have to have a balanced view of God. And what I mean by that is we can't esteem any one uh, characteristic of God, any one attribute of God more than the other, because to do so makes him not God. Right. One of the attributes of God, as we'll get to and we'll talk about what it means for an attribute to be an attribute. Um, but we'll talk about the importance of balance in God. Right. It's an aspect of his perfection that every attribute that he has, he has. He exists in that state of being in perfect balance. Right. Because a part of perfection is balance. If you are imbalanced, that would be something imperfect. Right. Um, and so if you have a question about anything I'm saying or something doesn't make sense, you want me to explain, uh, go further, go deeper, let me know. But I'm going to otherwise stay on the surface of these topics because theology proper has so much. I cannot cover it in this short time that I have with you. OK, so theology proper. When we talk about emphasis, right, there are four quadrants, if you will, to the way humans perceive God. Everything that we know about God can be summed up into these four quadrants, more or less, right? And you can find these quadrants um, specifically in a book uh, called America's Four Gods. And when it talks about America's Four Gods, it's not saying that America serves four gods. 
Uh, to be honest, America probably serves many more than four gods. Um, but the four ways that in America we tend to, and basically most modern or Western, specifically Western culture, but even modern culture, the way we conceptualize God, we do that in four ways. And these four ways that we conceptualize God are so different, so drastically differing from each other that they can almost be classified as four separate gods, right? So the four ways that we conceptualize God, love, just, present, transcendent. I'm going to say it again. Love, just, present, and transcendent. Okay. So when we talk about these, if you look at these, these tend to sit sort of in opposition to each other. So if you think about a chart, right? Like a, 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 a graph, you think about the X axis and the Y axis, X going left to right or right to left, uh, Y axis going top to bottom or bottom to top. So it looks like this, right? Each of these four sections, right, are going to be quadrants that exist somewhere in this axis, right? So the axis uh, on this spectrum is love on the left, just on the right, right? And then presence at the top, transcendence on the bottom, right? Now you can put these any which way, but the point is that love and justice must be on the same axis and opposite, right? And presence and transcendence must be on the same axis and opposite. So you can have one going a left and right and the other, or you can mix and match, but the point is that they have to be polar opposites to each other. The reason this is important is because people tend to preach God in one of these four ways. They will treat God as love. God is love. You've heard that, right? God is such a loving God. Absolutely. This is true. God is a just God. He has a sense of justice. Uh, and along with justice, we put righteousness and holiness and those kinds of things in the same way that along with love, we put compassion and mercy and empathy, right? Then we have God is present, as in he's engaged, as in he's active, as in he's interactive. This is where we put, you know, God's ability to speak to us, to intervene in our lives, to interrupt our lives, to lead and guide our lives. He's present. Then we also put God's transcendence. This is another aspect of God's holiness, which we'll get to later, but God being above and beyond his bigness. This is where we place things like eternity, like immortality. His ways are beyond ours. That sense of being separate and apart and above, beyond, right? So the reason we have to hold these in balance, right? If, if this is our graph, we need to be right here where that knuckle is, dead center. As in, we need to equally assess God's love and his justice, and we need to equally assess God's presence and his transcendence, right? So the reason for that is because when you don't, when you lean too much to one side, you end up with a God that's very different than the God expressed in the Bible, which is very different than the God that, that how God expresses himself. If you look at scripture, scripture isn't just God's words, but if you think about the fact that scripture talks about God, it's what God says about himself. So if we believe that God is who he says he is, then we must trust that what he says about himself is the correct view of himself. It's the correct uh, perspective on him, right? Which is why we use the Bible to color everything else, right? So when you talk about this, for people who say love and they go all the way to the side of love, right? Love, 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 love. Well, the problem with that is that if God is all love and no justice, then he's basically a pushover, right? As powerful as he is, he's a pushover. And you can see that concept being displayed in a lot of people's perspective of God, right? Because what they'll do is they'll say, they'll focus, you know, the, in terms of the churches that emphasize love to the detriment of all those other attributes, right? What they'll say is God wants a love relationship with you. Absolutely true. God loved you so much that he forgave you of your sins. True. God loves you so much that anything you do, he'll love you in spite of it. Okay. I can get with that. God love you so much that no matter what you do, no matter what life you live, you'll still go to heaven. This is where we get into 
the other stuff. That emphasis of love is what pushed people like um, uh, Carlton Pearson. I use him as a reference, a modern day reference. Pushed people like Carlton Pearson to say that God will never send a person to hell because whether you're saved or not, whether you're an atheist or a believer, that that hell is for the 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 you know. He he started off saying that hell is for uh, demons and the devil, right? And he just cut out that part of the Bible that says and that nation that forgets God. Right. Uh, he kind of cut that part out. He just said hell is for demons and the devil, uh, Satan. And then he went on to say hell doesn't exist. Right. That everybody gets to go to heaven. That uh, And this is not something new. This is something that was perpetuated in the earlier parts of the church where people were arguing that because God is love and, and the scripture says he would that none would be lost, that the absoluteness of Jesus's sacrifice on the cross meant that everyone on the planet, everyone who would ever be born was saved, which means everybody gets to go to heaven and nobody gets to go to hell. And this is the uh, erroneous doctrine that Carlton Pearson borrowed for when he began to speak and preach that uh, hell wasn't for humans and that people wouldn't go to hell, which directly contradicts even Jesus's parable. Right. When he talks about the rich man and Lazarus and La uh, the uh, they both died and the rich man ended up in suffering, in torment. Right. It, it 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 contradicts what the Bible says in Revelations, where it talks about death and hell and all of those people who forgot God or received the mark of the beast being cast into the lake of fire. Right. That contradicts scripture. But you would ignore that or you would seek not to find out the truth of that because your focus is only on the love of God. So you neglect the justice of God, the sense of righteousness that God has a standard of holiness to which all of us have to live up to. OK. Um, then there's those people who emphasize justice over everything else. Right. Justice over everything else. And what that means uh, is that they are more focused on the rules of God, the wrathful God. These are the people that preach the fire and the brimstone and they don't preach the love of God at all, right? They just say Jesus Christ died for your sins, but they don't say that he did it as an act of love or an act of self-sacrifice or an act of humility. They focus on just that as the key to getting you out of hell because of the wrathful and vengeful and angry God who is, you know, sitting with a big lightning bolt ready to, you know, destroy all of creation. Right. And then you get people like the Westboro Baptist Church. Right. That push hate and the anger of God more than the love of God. You know what I mean? They will. And this is not to get too political, but I'm using specific uh, examples in our modern world so that you can get the picture, right? Um, so people who are all about justice, this is what gets into legalism, that doing right makes you right, right? That, that doing these certain kinds of things or abstaining from these kinds of things is what saves you, is what keeps you, is what makes you righteous, what makes you holy before God. And then you get into a salvation based on works, right? Uh, not on grace because grace is an extension of God's love and it's an extension of God's goodness. So if you're emphasizing justice, then all you're going to be talking about is the standard and what happens when you don't meet that standard, right? The standard and discipline. You're going to be talking about the wrath of God, the 10 plagues, the God of the Old Testament, right? Or you're going to pick out things from the New Testament like revelations that specifically talk about the judgment of the world by God, by Jesus, right? And that makes sense, and that is true, but it must be held in balance with God's love because God's not all justice as much as he's not all love. Moving quickly, God is present, absolutely. He interacts. But the emphasis, the overemphasis of God's presence in this world places him in the place of an all-powerful child, as in he is affected. And sure, the scripture says that we have a high priest that is not unaffected or untouched by our infirmities, that is to say that Jesus Christ understands what we suffer as humans, or God understands what we suffer as humans because Jesus Christ makes intercession for us, Jesus being God, and Jesus walked on this earth. He experienced pain, suffering, hunger, loss, sadness, heaviness, all of those different things, right? But that is not to say that we can control God because he's present, that we can make God feel bad. You know, people, uh, there's a song 
as much as it's beautiful, but there are song lyrics and there are books, uh, there are quotes that talk about making God feel sad, right? We hurt God's feelings. And this represents a, a mutability, an ability of God to be changed and affected or influenced, even overwhelmed by the actions of man, right? Which takes away from that transcendence aspect of him being beyond. Yes, God can identify with our pain and our suffering and that he understands it. He empathizes with it because Jesus walked on this planet, right? So God is not disconnected from those things, right? Also, you uh, you know, people could argue that it wasn't until, you know, uh, uh, Jesus came on the scene that, that God was able to experience human suffering. So Old Testament, God was not uh, empathetic. But that's untrue because the Bible talks about God's duty, his loyalty, and his love to Israel, even when they backslid, right? He, they, he's the husband to an adulterous wife. That's the, the image that's placed in the Old Testament. But not just that, because God created us in his image and in his likeness, then to a degree we feel what he feels. But because we are not uh, 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 infinite in the sense that we express everything in, in, in infinity, then we can't feel things to the degree that God feels. And then also because we're not perfect, then we feel those things in imbalance. When we feel anger, it's not tempered by our love or our knowledge or our justice or our understanding or our compassion. We just feel anger, right? And when we feel head over heels in love, we or compassion or mercy, it can tend to cloud our judgment in that we don't reconcile that often or perfectly with our justice, our sense of reason, our sense of logic, our sense of temperance or control. Right. So the idea is that God is angry. God gets angry in scripture the way we do. But when I say the way we do, it's that it's the same emotion, but it's not felt in the same way. What's the word? God is a jealous God, but he has the right to be jealous. When we feel jealousy, it's from a sense of entitlement where God is the only being in the universe that's worthy of being entitled. So it's not entitlement. It's just what he's due. Right. It's what he deserves as the king of the universe. Makes sense. Um, so the idea is that even though we see God as present, we can't say that he's totally affected. Right. And so you'll have those people that, you know, oh, you got a love on God and God misses you. He misses his talks with you and all of those other different things. We can't put God into the small bubble of being affected by us in the way uh, uh, that we are affected by each other. Makes sense. And then also God can't be so transcendent that he's detached. Some people look at God as God is a uh, he's a kid on an anthill. You know what I mean? He just created a world and then he left it to itself. He, uh, you know, things in motion. And that's the, for those people who can't reconcile a loving God with the evil that exists in the world and how these terrible things like coronavirus, like tsunamis, like the Holocaust can happen with a God who is all powerful. How can he allow these things to happen? So then they resolve that he's a he's so transcendent that he's detached that he's not invested in the affairs of the world. He's only thinking about things that concern himself or he has no thoughts or opinions on the world. He just, you know, manages the universe and that he sustains it. But the actual well-being or the state that we live in is he's beyond that, right? And that takes everything away from the scriptures that deal with uh, uh, God's love, his investment in humanity. You know, he wants us to prosper even as our soul prospers. You know, he wants to bless us, to make us the head and not the tail. You see God's engagement, so we can't put him so far in the transcendent column. And this is why it's good to have a balance. You can't have a balance, though, if you don't understand who God is. So let's talk about some of these characteristics that go a little bit deeper into these four quadrants. As we get into the characteristics of God, how many people have just thought about God and said, hmm, like, what is God really like? Like, like you've, you've had a desire to understand more about who he is, not just relationally, but in his being and character. Well, this is what uh, this begins to dive into. So everything about God, every characteristic about God, right, can be divided into two large sections or two large categories, right? His moral attributes and his non-moral attributes. Now, this is not to say, notice I've said non-moral, not amoral. Amoral means not moral. 
But non-moral here is in the sense of nothing to do with morality. Attributes that have no sway in his moral or ethical uh, state. Right. So let's discuss the non-moral attributes. I say that because the moral attributes are things that we are um, keenly aware of. If you grew up in church at all, you've heard people say uh, the stuff about God's goodness, his love, his holiness, his graciousness. Um, he's impeccable. He can't do any wrong. He's righteous. Um uh, and those kinds of things. So you've heard a lot of those things. I want to spend more time on those non-moral attributes because we don't hear about those as much. So what are the big ones? We say God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Those are the ones we remember because they have omni in it, right? Omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, knowing all, all-knowing, right? And omnipresent, as in all places. He's aware of all places. He's in all places. You know, Psalms 139, where can I go from your presence, right? And when God is referred to in Genesis 1, it says Elohim, as in the creator of all, the all-powerful, right? Um, and then, of course, omniscience, his ways is higher than ours. He knows everything. You know, a part of being everywhere and having all power is knowing all things, right? Um, if you consider knowledge as a type of power, you know, it makes more sense there. So non-moral attributes concern themselves with God's being, right? How he exists, right? How his being exists in the universe, right? Or, well, yeah, I'll say in the universe, understanding that God transcends the universe as well. He's not a being within the universe. But when I say in the universe, I mean in our reality, okay? So, we kind of understand what those are. All places, um, all times, he's in the future, he's Alpha and Omega, he's the beginning and the end. Um, he is fills the length and breadth of the world. Uh, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Um, the inhabitants and all they that dwell therein, it's all his, he's everywhere in it. He knows all and he's all powerful, right? But let's get into some other things. Eternity. Eternity is an attribute of God that is specifically an attribute of God. Right now, we have to have to clarify some things because there's a lot of things that people say that sounds good when they're preaching, but they don't consider the theological ramifications of what they're saying. They just say it because it sounds good and everything that sounds good doesn't actually make sense. Right. So eternity, you can't look at eternity as a place. Right. Eternity is not a place. Eternity is more or less a characteristic of God's being. Right. I say eternity is not an, not a place because, you know, eternal. We use words like eternal to describe things. Right. Um, but even saying eternal is a little bit of a catch 22. Right. Because if we talk about our eternal resting place, our eternal future. Right. Eternity means that something had a beginning that that something does not have either a beginning or an end right? Neither a beginning nor an end, right? It always existed. It will always exist, right? So eternity can't represent time. The two are contradictions. Time has a distinct starting point and a distinct stopping point. Eternity does not. Time is a line. Eternity is a circle. Make sense? And more accurately, time is a line segment, right? Because even lines, people think about or they try to describe eternity as uh, 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 like a line, you know, going uh, in both directions infinitely. But time is more like a, a line segment, as in it has a period, a distinct start, and a distinct end, right? Eternity would be a circle around that line. Make sense? And not in the sense that you can get from one point in eternity to another point in eternity by traveling that line, but more accurately, a segment within the circle. So you'd have a segment that's about this, maybe this big, and then you'd have a big old eternity, right? That no amount of traveling on this line will ever get you to eternity, but eternity encompasses time. Make sense? So we call eternity an aspect of God because God is the only being in existence that is eternal. Right. So we can't say our eternal resting place because our eternal resting place, yes, will be there forever from. But that forever starts at a point. So it looks if you know math, it looks like what's called a ray. An array has a starting point dot on one end and then it's a straight line with an arrow right on the other end. 
right? So dot on one end and it continues forever in one direction. That is more or less what our existence is as a soul, as a spirit, right? Our souls won't be destroyed in the sense that they won't cease to exist. But when we die, our souls will go to heaven. Generally speaking, I won't get into eschatology and, and where heaven is and, and Abraham's bosom versus uh, uh, the, the new Jerusalem and all those things. But just generally speaking, they'll go to be with God in life eternally and eternally in the sense of forever from that point, forever more, right? Versus they'll go into a uh, uh, torment in hell forever more from that starting point in. So do you see how understanding God even starts to change how you look at eschatology, how you look at where you're going to spend eternity, where you're going to go when you die and how you exist as that, right? Our spirits and our souls have a start. They start from when we're conceived. They existed only in the mind of God and in the, to the extent that he had an intention to bring us into reality from his mind, to birth us into the world, right? But our soul and our spirit are created, which means they have a starting point. This earth, this universe was created. It has a starting point. Even the angels are created, Right now, the angels and the devil, and, and, and I say that because they're fallen angels, they exist in that same way in that they have a they, they were created. They're not eternal beings like God. They were created, but they'll continue to live forever. Right. They'll continue to exist forever is what I'll say. God doesn't have a beginning. Everything else that exists has a beginning. You understand that? OK, so and, and this is why we have to be careful when we say, where are you going to spend eternity? Because spend eternity, eternity isn't a period of time. So you can't say spend eternity. Make sense? Uh, and you can't also say, um, you know, we're going to eternity because eternity is not a place. Um, eternity is an attribute of God, right? So we have to be very careful how we use those things, right? Now, truthfully, you'll probably use that in some way. But at the very least, I want you to understand what it means, even if you say it out of habit. Um, it's going to kind of be hard for church folk to get away from, hey, where are you going to spend eternity when you're asking somebody if they're saved or not, if they accepted Jesus Christ? You know, that's just a part of the way we talk now. But I also need you to understand the logic in what it is and what it's not. Perfection, as we talked about, God is perfect, right? So his love is in complete balance. When we say perfect, all of the attributes that are perfect to have, all of the good qualities. And a theologian said it like this, God exists as a holder, right? Or a, 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 an expression of all G qualities. That's what it's called in theological terms, as in qualities that are attributed to God. Things like omnipotent, omniscience, uh, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, power, authority, sovereignty, will, uh, holiness, love, all of those things. All of the things that are deemed reasonably to be desirable qualities, those are the things that God expresses and perfectly. So by perfectly, it firstly means that he has to express it infinitely, that there can be no one more good than God. There can be no one more holy or nothing more holy than God. There can be nothing and no one more eternal than God. He has to exist as a perfect version of everything that he exists as. He can't be this thing, but the worst or sort of okay. He has to be the best in essence at everything that he exists as. Does that make sense? Keeping that in mind, um, that a part of that perfection uh, leads to something called aseity, right? Again, his transcendence. God exists beyond. Because he created the universe, he can exist as a member of the universe in that sense that he's contained by the universe, Right. And the Bible even speaks to that, that the entire all of creation can't even contain you. Right. Because you are beyond and he has to be beyond because if God existed within the confines, notice what I say, confines of the universe, then that means the universe would have influence on him. The universe would be greater than God. And it is not because it's a creation. So for him to create the universe, he would have to exist outside or beyond the realm of the universe. <laughs> beyond the realm of the universe so that he can create the universe as big as it is, right? So when you think transcendent, don't think above only, but also think beyond. Not just transcendent, but he's also imminent. 
as in he's present in the world. He is engaging in, in, in um, interacting with the world. He is immutable. That means he is non-changing, right? So think about this. When we talk about God's immutability, God is unchanging because the necessity to change, if you have to change, that means that there is something about your present state that is not the best that you need to improve in order to adapt to this new situation, right? We talk about ice melting. Ice melting is a form of change. That means that the outer influence of heat causes the ice to need to change to adapt to the new environment that's warmer than the frozen environment of ice. Water changing into steam, same situation. And also backwards, if the temperature drops, the absence of heat causes water to need to change phases. So this, this is why we have to be very careful when we talk about God changing his mind, more or less, right? God can act and then he can counteract things but in terms of change, in the sense that God changes something in, in terms of his, 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 his attributes, that's a dangerous thing. God doesn't change his mind about stuff. Notice what the Bible says, right? The Bible says that God uh, 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 does things like in the Old Testament with the Israelites. And then it says he repented of his wrath. It doesn't say he changed his mind. It says he turned. As in he changed, not changed, but he started doing something different. And I say that in a very mindful sense in that he started something and he stopped something, but I'm, I'm taking very great care to not describe it as change in the sense that his character changed, right? So God didn't stop demanding justice. It's just that his justice in his own perspective was appeased. Make sense? So he still had the requirement to fulfill, but once that requirement was fulfilled, then his, his, his actions went to something different. He started initiating other actions. Does that make sense? When it talks about him repenting, him turning, not that he had to say sorry or that he had to show remorse, but he's turning from something to something else, right? But when we talk about God's immutability, God doesn't like murder, that won't change tomorrow. God is holy. That won't change tomorrow. It didn't change. Uh, he didn't start not liking murder today, but he was okay with it in the Old Testament. No, God, we have to understand that God exists in balance because people will say that. People will say that in the Old Testament, you know, God was all wrath. He was all venge vengeance. He was all standards and law, right? In the New Testament, he's all love. He's mushy-wushy, which is why people reject the God of the Old Testament and they say, oh, after Jesus came, God's character changed. That's not true because then that would mean that God was less than. He was imperfect. He was somehow uh, incomplete in the Old Testament when in reality it was man that was imperfect and Jesus's uh, a sacrifice reconciled us to be able to enjoy more of the love and the compassion that God already had, right? God's love is what drove him to accept the lamb as an offering over the death of people, right? And to impugn the sin and the unrighteousness and the evil that existed in an entire nation of Israel into one goat. That's love because the full recompense of the sin of Adam and Eve is that all of humanity deserved to die. Period. All of humanity deserved to be wiped out and to continue to be wiped out and to continue to be destroyed because such is the greatness of our transgression and rebellion in the person of Adam and Eve. Such was their greatness and the depth of their transgression against God. Right. You think about God's response to rebellion when Satan rebelled and he convinced a third of the angels to rebel. He expelled them from heaven. Does that make sense? He expelled them from heaven because something that was contradictory to God could not exist where God was. So his very presence and nature expelled them from heaven, right? So if you think about expelling humanity from existence, what is that? That's death. That's utter, complete destruction. So the fact that he didn't kill is a testament to God's love. Make sense? So to say that God was all wrath and only a little bit of love, he didn't change. He didn't grow, right? His 
dealings with us, our way or our method of dealing with him changed, but he didn't change. His standard of justice is the same. It is just as high as it was in the Old Testament, right? And his mercy that we see in the New Testament, what we live in today is just as potent as it was in the Old Testament. God is impassable. He feels, but not in the way that we do, right? God is not, we're not, we don't have the ability to make God feel sad or hurt God's feelings, if that makes sense, right? And this is why you have to be very careful. There's a song called Blue God, right? It talks about, uh, the song is uh, about the way humans, the way believers treat God. You know, they call them when they need them and when they don't, it's all about, you know, their personal, you know, egocentrism and all of those things. The problem is in the chorus, the chorus, the reason it's called blue God is because it says, if you were a color, you would be a blue God. And the danger in that is we diminish God's transcendence because we're now saying, God, I can hurt your feelings. I have the power to make you upset. The Bible talks about, you know, God's anger being kindled, right? But his anger is not, it's because a law of his, a standard of his was not met because something in the universe began to be contradictory to him, right? And his very essence and being and the way he designed the universe the universe itself rejects things that are contrary to God. Everything is created in a state of goodness. So it doesn't comprehend evil, doesn't comprehend sin. And this is why we have the, the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the hurricanes and all of those things. We have death, we have viruses, we have bacteria. It's the universe's uh, 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 response to dealing with something that it was never designed to deal with. And that's sin. Right. So when we talk about the anger of God, it's literally God's being rejecting that which is inconsistent with him. Make sense. So uh, we, we have to be careful in how we determine we he, God is not affected by us the way we're affected by other people. Right. He feels, but he is not overwhelmed by feeling. God is not an emotional God that throws tantrums. He's not that kind of God. In that sense, he's impassable. And the scripture says, you know, no one served. God is not served by human hands. In other words, we can't feed God. God doesn't feel hunger. He doesn't feel sexual drive. He doesn't feel uh, all of those other human emotions that we feel that drive our interactions with other people. Does that make sense? Okay. So not just that, but he exists as a spirit. This is referred to as his incorporeality. That means he exists outside of the natural spectrum of things. He exists as a spirit in the spiritual world. Um, his sovereignty, he reigns above all. He doesn't just exist with all power, but he gave his power to somebody else to rule. But God, as in the fullness of God, exists sovereignly. He reigns over everything. He controls everything. He manages and he sustains everything. And lastly, God's oneness, right? And this deals with God's simplicity. God's oneness as in even though he exists in the expression as three persons, he is expressed as three different persons, three distinct, not different, but three distinct persons or uh, uh, personages, right? They are all of the same essence, of the same being, of the same mind. Very briefly, I'm going to touch on the moral attributes. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. So very briefly, right, we, um, I'm going to touch on the moral attributes, remembering again, and I've kind of already dealt with them a little bit, that they, they exist in balance, in perfection. So goodness, God is good. Oh, and let me preface this with all of God's non-moral and moral attributes as a byproduct of him existing in infinity and in eternity and in perfection. They are not just in balance and the greatest expression, but they're absolute as in they can't change and they are definitive, right? This is an absolute. Everything else is based off of this. When we say absolute, that means this is the highest form of truth, right? So moral attributes, goodness, God is absolutely good, as in there can be no evil or anything that's not good or less than good in him, right? God is love, so there can be nothing that contradicts love in him. God is holy. Now, holiness is understood in two different ways, majesty holiness and purity holiness, 
right? When you think majesty, think a monarch, think a king, right? A king doesn't go and wallow in the mud with the pigs. A king doesn't go and eat at the same table with the commoners. He is majestic in the sense that he is above, he is apart. And that holiness means that he is apart from everything else that is, right? It kind of goes in line with that transcendence, but in terms of a quality, not a attribute, but in terms of a, 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 a quality of his character, his character, his thoughts are separate from sin, separate from evil, separate from those things that are lesser. So majesty, holiness, then purity, holiness, again, in the also separate, but in the sense that they're not contaminated, right? So not just apart from, but free from. Then we have graciousness. So God's goodness, catch this, God's goodness is an inherent internal characteristic of his own being. Morally, he is good. His graciousness is that goodness expressed out. That's external, right? His graciousness is interactional. How he expresses that goodness, that love, that holiness, all of those things toward us right? That's how we get grace and mercy. That's how we get compassion and blessings and favor and all of those things because his goodness is expressed outward. So that's graciousness. His impeccability, God cannot sin and he cannot be wrong. It's not that he just doesn't have sin, but he could never have sin within him. It's not just that he does not sin, but he could never sin. It's not possible for God to sin. Also infallible, he cannot be wrong. He cannot contradict himself. Infallibility is more on the non-moral side, but in the sense that he can't lie, right? Everything that he says is absolutely true. And so in that sense, you see it morally, but from a non-moral perspective, he can't be wrong. He can't contradict. He can't, uh, and nothing can be more absolute than him. God is just as in he's fair, he has a standard that people, and this is also, again, interactional, his quality of justice or justness inherent in him requires that he hold everyone else to the same standard of fairness. This is why we have rules. This is why we have law. This is why certain things are not allowed, because God has a standard to which everyone needs to live up. Um, and thanks so much for tuning in uh, this far. And please, if you like what I'm talking about, uh, definitely thanks for being interactive. Share the video so more people can see it, so more people can be informed about what it is we believe as believers. God doesn't just exist, but he exists and he interacts with us. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, next week in terms of how God interacts with us. We're going to talk about uh, the way that he reveals himself. But I want you uh, to, to tune in, whoever you are, wherever you are, I want you to tune in, bring your questions uh, in terms of the way God reveals himself. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I invite my wife on because she has a very unique perspective on how God reveals himself to people. And I want uh, definitely to have her on here. She's going to bless us with some amazing wisdom uh, and some amazing insight into her personal testimony on uh, God's revelation, both specific and general. So this is going to be epic. You don't want to miss it. Do me a favor, share this video before you get off. I know you might have shared it already, but please share this video, share it in the groups that you're a part of, share it on your timeline, tag a few friends in it so that they can get this information in this video, but also so that they can be looking for uh, on next week. Also uh, in the comments, if there's any particular type of or branch of theology that you'd like me to cover or that you'd like to know more about, Put it in the comments, uh, and, and after we get through the first few, I'll definitely start to chip away at some of those things that you guys want to hear about. But I want to uh, make this interactive. I want this to be something uh, that blesses people, that enhances people, uh, and that changes people for the better, okay? Uh, so definitely put it in the comments, what branch of theology or aspect of the Bible, scripture, whatever church, polity, whatever the case is that you'd like to know more about and we can discuss it, all right? I love y'all. God bless y'all. It's my prayer. Stay safe. Grace and peace. Take care.